And isn't it funny because sometimes uh, the best people for planting a church or a micro church uh, often lament the thought that I've got to take a pay cut to go and be the leader of that particular church, where in actual fact, talking about a micro church opportunity, you don't take the pay cut because you're not leaving your day job. And there is a sense here in which you can have, uh, you know, middle class or even wealthier people who are actually doing something so significant and making things happen. And they're not actually giving up their their career to actually do that. Is that something you might see around the world? Is this, you know, tent maker idea, you know, working your day job and doing something in your spare time? Is this, you know, catching on in any significant way that you've observed? Yeah, I think it is. And it's and it's also, I mean, it's key in the developing world. No one gets paid to plant churches in the developing world. Most of them are working full-time jobs and doing that outside of that sort of space. So it's like the, the Western world, I guess, is starting to catch up with what's been really um, catalyzing church planting and movement in the, in the majority world. A question that comes to my mind, how fast can you multiply these micro churches uh, if you've got a, a movement of people and you know there's an outreach and there's some pastoral care there's lots of invitations i'm sure i'm sure assuming there's lots of sort of hospitality involved in that because you're building yes. friendship uh, foundations how fast can you multiply and i, I might even get to uh, you know how you actually you know divide and multiply but but you know how fast have you seen this happening yeah so i've seen them multiply within a year where we've had one community, it's seen people come to faith, they've started to disciple and then they've multiplied. Um, most of the time you see that happen within kind of one to three years. Often if you see micro churches who are three or four years in and haven't multiplied, then you need to actually spend time with them, helping them um, reassess who they're reaching, reassess what their discipleship methods are and what tools they're using and, and maybe just, I guess, realign. And if you are in a ordinary local church, uh, you've got a building, it's been there for 60 years, maybe it's been there for 100 years, and uh, you keep turning up each week and you're one of the regulars, you've got a real loyalty and uh, faithfulness in that church, uh, to be able to get a new way of thinking and, and, and start a micro church that doesn't necessarily meet in your uh, local building, and maybe you're meeting in a modern building uh, or a cafe or something like that, how does that sort of fit with people? Because when we talk about the way Australians are changing, not everybody's attract, uh, attracted to uh, you know meeting in a cathedral or a meeting in a church that's 100 years old. How do you think uh, people are responding to the thought that you might be meeting in cafes or uh, restaurants or yeah. even pubs? Uh, what are your thoughts here? Yeah, well, my personal microchurch is like a little... And we have who wouldn't walk into church because they've had some previous history and experience that just makes that a barrier that's too far for them to cross. But they will happily come into the local neighbourhood centre with us. And we're seeing stories like that all over Australia where people are meeting in various different places. There are communities that are just committed to meet in cafes. There are communities who meet in pubs. Um, anywhere that is a place that people feel comfortable to be able to engage in, trying to take away the barrier that is sometimes the building of the church. And our experience has been that most churches are actually pretty open to this. They're not offended um, by by these newer communities that are birthing off, reaching in other places. The, the Fresh Expressions movement in the UK is full of this. Existing churches who are birthing off a smaller micro-expression in some community space. And they don't necessarily become uh, alternative uh, denominations, uh, because you mentioned uh, Anglicans and you mentioned Baptists. If you are in an mm -hmm. Anglican church or a Baptist church and you plant a micro church, that doesn't mean it's not Anglican or Baptist anymore, does it? No doubt if you've got that connection to that oversight, which is actually your protection, uh, then, you've got to, then you've got something pretty solidly in place. And then uh, the sending church or the planting church actually gets to claim you as a you know as something of fruit from from good ministry I mean I mean there's a lot of dynamics going on as to how everyone sees these things what are your thoughts around that yeah there's a there's a new move when I started 10 years ago denominations didn't really want to hear about micro churches 
Uh, but now pretty much every denomination is open to accepting micro churches. It makes their books look good. There's more people on the numbers. And most of them are actually sorting out how do they support these micro churches? How do they do leadership development? How do they do coaching? How do they do accountability? Um, so they've got some great systems set up in place. So now um, most micro churches, I think, would find a home within one of our many denominations across Australia. I think some listeners will be starting to catch on to this uh, title that you bear, Leadership Acceleration Catalyst, because uh, my suspicion is, Bree, that if someone decides to step out of the boat and go to walk on the water and they're going to have their, their own go at, uh, at uh, starting a micro church, that their leadership capacity is accelerated because all of a sudden uh, they're under a bit of a weight of responsibility and there's lots of things that you need to know. Uh, thoughts here about accelerating your uh, your maturity by actually having a go at doing something like this? Yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's funny. Often we think in leadership that we need to have all this training before we step out. But I think if you watch what Jesus did with the disciples, he gave them the training as they stepped out. And I think um, just-in-time learning is kind of a principle that's well known throughout lots of other fields. But it's it's about actually learning as you go and learning on the road. And I think that's what most micro church leaders end up having to do. And it creates a great dependence on Jesus. If you're stepping out, you have no idea what you're stepping into. That's a great place to be as a follower of Jesus. 